Good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Andrew Harvey, and I am the CEO of uh, BMA Group. Thank you all very much for, for joining our webinar this morning. Um, I was saying earlier, actually, at BMA Group, we've been actually been running a lot of webinars uh, for comms and, and marketing uh, professionals over the last few months. And as you might expect, uh, given the challenges of, of the last six months, those webinars have been very popular. However, none of them have, have been as popular as, uh, as the webinar that we put on this morning. We had um, just over 400 people registered to attend, uh, which I think in itself is absolutely fantastic feedback. Uh, I think really demonstrating that, that so many of you are interested in, in the research you're doing, which is, which is absolutely fantastic. But I guess to a degree, understandable as well, um, because the research that we've, we've completed provides a fantastic insight um, into the minds and the thoughts of CEOs, uh, CEOs from across the UK and Europe, as say, sort of providing a little glimpse into their, their minds and their thoughts and their views specifically on the corporate communications function, um, the role of communications, uh, particularly in their business, but also in, in the wider uh, business environment too. <clears throat> and I think we all know there's lots of, there's lots of research out there in, in the market where comms professionals have been surveyed. And we've asked those comms people about their views on communications and their views on challenges and opportunities. But, but I think there's less research out there that specifically focuses on the views of CEOs and, and their views on, on communications. And I think that's why uh, this, um, this particular piece of research uh, has proven uh, really popular. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I am, uh, that's me, that's me on the left-hand side. Um, but uh, also you know, particularly uh, delighted to be joined by my colleague, uh, Willem de Heiter, um, who's uh, up there, you should be able to see on the screen as well. So Willem is BMA Group's Executive uh, Director in Europe. That's actually been a driving force behind uh, the research that we've done here. And uh, uh, Willem will be sharing uh, the results of some of that research with us uh, today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, uh, massive thanks, uh, massive thanks, and uh, hugely delighted both Willem and myself to be joined uh, this afternoon by our fantastic uh, panellists and guest speakers, um, all of which um, you know, are highly experienced, as you can see, comms, uh, Marcoms leaders from a, from a number of large, <clears throat> well-known, but also very different organisations uh, from across Europe. So uh, fantastic uh, to have them all on board. A big thanks to Naomi uh, from Suez, to Abenad from Tartu Consultancies, uh, Luca from MSC Cruises, and also Mark from Google too. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Um, so we'll be asking our panellists uh, for their thoughts on, on the research um, and some specific topics of, of interest too. Um, but also you all have the chance to uh, ask questions or put questions to our panellists and to Willem and to myself too. So you can do that using the, the Q&A function. I'm sure we've all been living off Zoom or Teams or, or similar over the, the last few months. So you're all quite well versed, I'm sure, in, in, in using the, the Q&A function. So please do use it. Please feel free to post questions as they come to mind throughout the presentation and we'll pick up on them as we get to, uh, as we get to the appropriate point in the presentation. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with BMA Group, perhaps some say more so than others, so we've got a lot of people on, on, the, on the call this morning. So just very briefly to, to be confirmed who we are. So BMA Group is a, it's an international recruitment and, and executive search business, that's what we do. We are focused specifically on providing support to the communications and to the digital and to, and to the marketing sectors specifically. Um, established in 1978, uh, we've been doing this for a long old time now, you've know, been working at the, the heart of the communications industry um, for, for over 40 years. Um, we are headquartered in London, but actually we have key, key European hub offices, a particular key hub office in Amsterdam, um, but also in, in Brussels and, and Paris too. But actually our, our reach and our experience um, extends beyond those locations. And actually we have experience of working with organizations and their CEOs and their comms leaders, in businesses across the whole of Europe and Asia and the Middle East too. Um, next slide, please. So on to our research. Uh, so where did this all begin? Uh, well, actually back in 2016, uh, we published our, our first piece of research in, into, into the, the views of CEOs um, and we called it Beyond Communications, which actually you can still download uh, from our website. Uh, and this marked the beginning of our research and say specifically focusing on you know, the thoughts and the views of CEOs on the topic of communications and reputation management 
and you know, on their views of the communications function and in, in their organizations, but also uh, the function more broadly. And at that point, we interviewed uh, 40 CEOs, again, from organizations across uh, the UK and, and Europe. Um, uh, and actually, the, the response and the findings of, of that work four years ago predicted a new golden age for corporate communicators. Um, and that, that's what the research predicted four, four years ago, it's a new golden age for corporate communicators, which could be summarised into a few key themes. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so just actually looking um, at those themes, what were they? Um, <clears throat> so theme number one was that some um, CEOs wanted and expected broader support, broader support from their comms leaders more than ever before. Comm skills were an absolute given, but CEOs demanded more than that. They, they demanded that these comm skills be supported by a far greater set of business and commercial skills. And specifically, and this came through really strongly, they kind of demanded and, and wanted that their, their comms leaders to really get to know their own business internally, inside out, to really understand the mechanics of those organisations and the commercial challenges that they, their own businesses faced. The second theme was that CEOs wanted their comms directors and their CCOs to play a, a more strategic role in the organization and, and, and more than ever before. Um, and actually advising on not just comms strategies, but actually business strategies, advising on the development of new products or the development of new services, not just promoting them, um, but actually advising on, on the development of, of them in the first place. And there was a really strong call for greater proactive, and I think that's the key word, proactive, strategic thinking and strategic counsel above and beyond, say, the communications remit. And then I think thirdly, <clears throat> you know, change, transformation, businesses continue to evolve. As CEOs wanted their communication leaders to play a greater role and have a greater input in, in the ongoing transformation of their business and, and the real future commercial growth of their organisations too. So say four years ago, uh, this research predicted a bright future for communicators and an increasingly, uh, an increasingly important position for communicators in, in the leadership of their organisations. Now, that's what it, that's what it predicted. Um, but next slide, please. But moving on, what has actually happened? Um, what actually happened in the last four years? Well, actually, we've spent the last 12 months conducting a follow-up report. We've revisited many of the same questions, many of the same themes that we researched uh, four years ago. And we wanted to know, in doing this, we wanted to know if that bright future that had been predicted in 2016 had actually come to fruition and actually materialised. And this time around, we interviewed just over 20 uh, CEOs, 24 CEOs, and we produced, therefore, very much a qualitative survey response. And, and we called this, uh, this research um, intercommunications. So the question is, how have things changed in, in the last four years? I'm now going to hand over to, to Willem, um, who is going to talk us through uh, the results of our, of our survey. Over to you, Willem. Thank you very much, and a very warm welcome to all of you attending uh, in Europe and, and, and abroad. Uh, maybe first, as an opening statement, I would like to say that we at VMA Group firmly believe that the conclusions from this survey, where the field was, was carried out pre-COVID-19, the conclusions have been firmly underlined in the last couple of months. The comms function was essential, has been stretched, and one could say even tested in a number of occasions. Quite some time ago, when I was working in international corporates, my first CEO was a Dutch man, and his name was Kaiser, which translates as emperor. My second CEO was a French man. And when he said in his company, in this company I am God, there was no sarcasm at all. And the only real opposition he met was when women started wearing nothing but pants for three months after he had told them to wear dresses to work. Uh, but, uh, well, he was a sort of an emperor as well. In these days, internal comms consisted of a couple of top-down memos and a few town hall meetings. Public affairs was a well-hidden secret, activity of an exclusive group of gentlemen. Investor relations was reserved for an equally exclusive group of board members. Public relations was about generating free publicity and product placements. Next time you see the famous scene with Sharon Stone in Basic Instinct, please look at the pack, the brand she has in her hand, because that was one of ours at the time, and we were really proud of that. 
that what was that was what PR was all about. And of course, in those days, you always had plenty of time to handle media relations and influence what was written about your company. And I think a couple of things have changed since then, actually. Here you see the key tasks as CEOs have defined them. I will talk a bit about all of them. The only one that's real short is probably change because quite clearly all CEOs fed back to us that without good communications, um, change is impossible. So that's, 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 uh, that's something that they clearly see. Can I have the next slide, please? All the classics remain. Um, probably all of you recognize these four points, uh, translator and storyteller, guardian and protection, protector of the company reputation, the brands, etc. Trusted advisor to the CEO and the board, and of course, heading up uh, for the comms leaders, the functional departments in, in their companies locally and internationally. Can I have the next slide, please? So, internal and external, and actually this is something that has changed compared to the first time we ran this survey. At that time, uh, quite a few CEOs still thought of internal comms and external comms as something of a separated activity, not always aligned. Um, now most of most do see them as really integrated efforts. Uh, the need to inform and get feedback from employees is clearly recognized. And the days that employees had to read in external channels about company development definitely is over. Um, and we've seen some organizational changes as well. There were more companies a couple of years ago than there are now where internal comms was reporting into HR. Um, now it has, in most cases, been added to other comms functions under one leader. Not everywhere, and you know we always have to be relative. There may be good reasons for that. Uh, next slide, please. Employee branding, employee engagement. One of the conclusions of our report that these have moved center stage, more so than a couple of years ago. Uh, and it is an understatement to say that employee engagement has become more important in recent months, of course. Um, even in companies where CEOs and board members did not have a lot of buy-in before COVID-19, this has now changed. So the change we saw in the report has been underlined, emphasized. We think it will stay that way. Um, by the way, it has not always been easy for communication departments to take on these increased employee engagement tasks. Uh, certainly, for example, I've spoken to quite a few people uh, where at the start of COVID-19, um, they were, uh, all board members were throwing new employee engagement suggestions to them every day. And they were not always prepared for that, but they have survived. Anyway, employer branding, employee engagement has moved center stage, underlined in the last couple of months, and there to stay. Next slide, please. Searching for sense in the digital storm. Actually, this was the heading in the Dutch Financial Times when they reported about our first survey. Um, and it still is very valid. Clearly, progress has been made. But the CEOs this time as well mentioned clearly that they think a lot more can be done. You'll see in yellow quotes in the report, you'll find the names of the CEOs that gave us these quotes. The last one, for example, I think we could do much, much more is a quote given to us by Tex Gunning from Leesplan in the Netherlands. Um, many CEOs see that the expertise for digital developments sits or has to sit into the communications function. Uh, and one may wonder, and some CEOs do it as well, whether appropriate people resources are always available. Whether, for example, the mix between communicators who have learned about digital and people who really think digital first is optimal in, in many companies. And we've seen that the group of so-called digital natives has been learning and developing in the last few years. We now know digital experts who have grown beyond their nerdy status and can bring it to the boardroom, who can translate measured data into needed activities. Digital, high on the agenda of all CEOs, central point uh, in future communication activities. And they're looking at their comms leaders to make it happen. Next slide, please. Other point, clearly moved center stage more so than a couple of years ago, CSR. Personally, I'm quite happy about that. But um, anyway, we've seen many companies, um, many CEOs feeding this back to us. They do realize 
public perception is not an issue, uh, one issue amongst many. It is a driving force behind uh, many decision-making processes. We've seen that in many job briefings we've been taken as well. Words have to be matched by reality. By the way, it is a critical element when attracting new young talent because new young talented candidates do ask us all the time about the CSR policies of companies uh, we are recruiting for. Uh, but more importantly, even as C CEOs clearly fed this back to us as something uh, that, that is becoming really important. We wonder, and maybe the discussion later will shed some light on that, whether in the recovery period after COVID-19, whenever that may start and whatever it may mean, whether CSR will or will not drop a couple of place, places on the priority lists. Even though in many governments, gov, in many countries, government support packages do drive, uh, let's say, green agendas. Next slide, please. Place in the organization as seen by the CEOs. The board issue is a non-issue. For quite some time already at VMA, and we have had numerous roundtable discussions with comms leaders in all our markets over the years, um, on the board or not, is not a discussion anymore. It's closed. It is what it is. What we do see at the same time is that in many cases, the comms director does participate also in early stages in relevant discussions and decision-making processes. What CEOs fed back to us as well, that the condition clearly is, and saying, out saying it out loud makes it very logical. Um, the comms directors should, should know what they are talking about. They should be aware of company critical processes, ranging from production issues to financial statements. This actually leads to one of the most firm recommendations we as VMA, VMA Group have to both existing and future communications leaders. Invest to get to know your company. Spend the time start understanding production, well, all critical issues that, that the company may have. Um, and this is also the best way to make your case for communications, uh, to proactively and with initiative support all functions. Uh, and of all this, of course, in the context that collaboration with HR, marketing and IT functions uh, are intensified as well. So those board issue, not an issue for CEOs anymore, uh, they also ask their comms leaders make the case for communications at the value where you think it should be added and we'll give you lots of room to do so even though you're not a per board member um, and do take care of functional alignments HR, employee engagement, internal communications it makes sense but CEOs see that as well next slide please the wish list uh, what do CEOs want from their comms leaders and departments <clears throat> Again, a couple of things clearly are recognizable to most of you, I guess. A safeguard, authenticity, transparency, honesty, personal integrity. CEOs keep feeding back to us that they expect their comms leaders to be one of the few people to keep them straight, to keep them honest. Um, so that definitely is one of the tasks. Understand external trends and developments, not only bringing the inside stories to the outside, but also bringing the relevant outside stories internally. Uh, and making sure that those who need to know are made aware of that. Uh, then, as mentioned, you know, lead the digital transformation of the comms function. As mentioned before, understand all critical business function and issues. And again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Yes, comms people uh, will be heavily involved at early stages of decision-making processes. But, and again, you know, if you say it loud, it sounds so logical. You have to know what you talk about, and then you will be invited to add value. And last but certainly not least, and some of you have been there intensively in the last period, I guess as well, be a cool head in crisis. Uh, keep the oversight and be the trusted advisor. And even more than that, when, uh, when there is a crisis coming your way. Next one, please. So if we very briefly summarize the findings, and there is a difference with what we saw in the Beyond Communication Survey a couple of years ago, um, where the job maybe was sketched as being a bit bigger than it is today. A critically important support function, but a support function nonetheless. CSR and employee branding are key reputation carriers. 
digitalization continues to guard a pace. And importantly, this does place, and CEOs do realize that, this does place new demands on communications requiring new skills, new competencies, and sometimes new people as well. Maybe coming back to, uh, to the last couple of months, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the communications departments have been stretched, they have been tested, weaknesses have been identified, and maybe there will be some consequences on that. Next slide, please which is my last slide, and then we will continue with uh, the panel members. This does not come from this survey. This comes from another survey we did and from having talked with quite a few communications directors as we constantly do. Uh, all these demands and expectations of CEOs, reasons for failure. Some CEOs may have a more limited vision or expectation, and in some cases that may even be understandable. <clears throat> so not all comms departments in all companies um, will have CEOs sharing the same vision. Um, another point is that, uh, I said, invest in your company, uh, get to know your company. Well, some communications people may be a bit reluctant to do so because it takes extra time and effort. Um, and you have to make that time and effort available to yourself outside the daily routine. Uh, Another option is that some communications people may be unable to, to invest the time or they may be so alienated from understanding the finances of the company, for example, that they just, they're not willing to make that investment or they're not able to make that investment. Importantly, of course, some companies with all these demands, there may be a lack of capacity in the communications team, a lack of skills in the communications team. Advice always is, of course, you know, identify them and address them. Uh, and if, uh, if nothing else, it will at least make clear why or why not certain expectations can be met, uh, better or worse. And then uh, last point before we turn to, uh, to, to, to the panel members, um, and we did see clearly that there is a need for further integration and collaboration, HR, marketing, uh, also IT, agile teams, digital developments, <laughs> IT language understanding. And in some cases, you know, comes people uh, merger and acquisitions has been on the table uh, in many companies and will be on the table for some time to come. Uh, and you'll be talking with lawyers and you have to be able to understand the lawyer's language as well. All that means, you know, the different departments in organization have to really act together. Uh, and if an organization stays too silent, either because there's a reluctance for collaboration or because there is some other maybe location limitation, um, but that may be a reason for not meeting the requirements as given to us by the CEOs in this survey. That's it for me. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Willem, for, for sharing those points. Um, what I would say is actually both of these reports can be downloaded from our website, so the most recent one, uh, but also the one that we published in 2016. So if you go to our website, um, you go to the, the Insight tab at the top, drop down, you'll, you'll find the, the reports in there. Please do, I mean, it sounds obvious, but please do go and read. There's a lot of detail in there. Um, and actually, you know, more detail than we can give justification to uh, this morning in terms of, or this afternoon in terms of our webinar. And it will really bring to life um, some of the things that, that Bill said. I actually conducted um, many of the interviews myself. Um, and actually some of the results might seem quite obvious, some of the things that we've talked about, um, quite obvious, perhaps even some of it quite basic, um, but actually these are genuinely the points um, that, that came up in the conversations. This really is what those CEOs are thinking about. So even if you think, as I say, you know, some of this stuff you know or you do, um, again, it's just worth reiterating that this is what CEOs are thinking. I think in some respects, some of this is quite, uh, you know, stuff that you will be familiar with, but I think it's about doing some of those things better than they've perhaps been done before. But as I say, please um, do go and, and download the reports and, and read them in full. Um, so, right, on to our speakers. Um, I can see that uh, we've got a couple of questions coming through, but I've also got some questions that I wanted to, to run through. Um, so, so we can go through some questions reflecting on the results of the survey, but also questions really within the context of COVID-19, because it would be it would be crazy to, to leave that out, um, even though that this research was, con was conducted over the last 12 months. So obviously we're going to pick that up um, to a degree. So I'm going to come to Luca 
first, if I may, in front of his lovely uh, cruise liner there, uh, one of their great cruise liners, MSC Cruises. Um, and just ask a couple of questions to Luke on, on the topic, I guess, uh, initially of the place in organisation. So just to you then, Luca, the, the report identified that you know, many senior communicators are still not really playing a full role in, in the broad and strategic decision making in, in their businesses outside of their immediate comms remit. However, I think given uh, you know, throughout the, the pandemic, throughout the current pandemic, you know, some of those communicators who were still seen by some leaders as purely comms advisors, they have actually stepped up and they have become more involved in that broader key decision making when it comes to the organisation. Um, from your perspective, do you think that this recent level of increased involvement and, and increased involvement in strategic decision making, do you think that that will now become the norm for communications leaders in a way in which it perhaps hasn't done before because of, because of COVID-19? Thanks for the uh, question, Andrew. And indeed, it is one of our ships behind me. Um, on, only a picture, as I mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, it's not a, a live ship, so to speak. Well, I, you know, I wish I had an answer to your question you know, at some stage, because I think my, uh, you know, my take on this is um, you know, that this is not over. That you know, that we, uh, you know, we're not out of the situations by any means, uh, and I think it's becoming uh, more and more clear that you know that the end is not in sight. And you know this is this applies, of course, to the uh, you know to the current uh, health situation you know that we're seeing you know around the world, but obviously to, you know to our jobs and roles. I think we have um, you know we have simply moved from a, when it comes to comms again or uh, corporate affairs or whatever you know whichever way we want to call out you know our roles. We simply move from sort of a pure emergency mode. Uh, to, uh, uh, well, actually, when it comes to the business, we move from a pure emergency mode to a situation in which, uh, you know, we're trying to, you know, to, 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 you know, to, to identify a, a way to run the business normally, but still within a, an emergency. And, and so this is putting us communicators in, you know, situations in which, uh, you know, we, we had to switch from a pure, you know, crisis, uh, you know, initial management uh, mode to one in which we need to continue to tackle the crisis but also you know we need to find a way to embrace the new uh, uh the new reality you know let's call it a reality not normality because there's nothing normal about, about what's going on uh, you know around us so is the new sort of improved role uh that you know that you described here to stay Again, I don't necessarily know that I, you know, that I have an answer, but I, you know, but I think we need to be um, realistic with each other and say that, you know, those who have excelled throughout the height of the crisis, uh, you know, I, you know, are going to, you know, to continue to, you know, to fight, you know, to hold on to that, you know, to that special role they built for themselves, um, um, you know, throughout this, you know, this next phase. Because, you know, the very same skills that made them excel and really, you know, help them getting closer, you know, gain an even more important role within their, you know, their organizations are not necessarily going to be the same roles that, you know, let's call it, you know, within this transitional, you know, period, this, uh, you know, you know, as we're tackling the new reality, which is not the, the final reality, it's not necessarily going to be the new normal, you know, and so again, the same skills are not going necessarily to apply now. So, you know, hopefully we'll all be here to see, <laughs> you know, what happens. But uh, again, I'm mindful of, of, of time. And so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, just, just thank you for that. Just a, just a follow up question on that point. So um, just in terms of the, the skills themselves. So in, in order to, for comms leaders to become or develop that, that strategic mindset, what key skills, what key skills do you think that up and coming comms leaders need to develop in order to be, the strategic council that their CEOs want them to be? Well, you know, I think this has been an ongoing uh, item of discussions, of, you know, amongst the, you know, communicators, you know, what, you know what, what do I need to focus on? So is that, you know, so financial skills, I mean, check, of course, uh, commercial skills, you know, 
possibly just as important as uh, as you know as, as financial skills. You need to understand your business not only from a financial perspective, whether or not you also are responsible for pure investor relations or only financial comps or whatever the case may be. But understanding the you know the commercial mentality of your organizations, the commercial needs of your organizations are, are you know are just as important. And at the end of the day, you, you know you are selling a product, a business, or, or what have you. So you are selling something into into the world. But I think the you know the the, the, the one set of skills that 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 I would urge uh, you know everyone to focus on. And and I think this is one of the, one of the, one of the one of the biggest lessons I myself learned throughout this uh, you know this past several months that I mean your I mean your ability to get under the skin of the business uh, under the skin of people really really get deep inside the organization. This is not just about you know understanding the business, understanding the dynamics. Uh, either you connect with the business and the people who lead this business, uh, but in a profound way. In a way in which sometimes it's uh, you know from a conversation you're picking up more from you know what's not being said than from what's you know being said, or you know or, you, or you'll have challenges. So you know those three sets of skills you know financial, commercial, and uh, I don't know what's called. Maybe you can help me your hands with uh, you know the ability to get under the skin of the organization and of the people of this organization, which incidentally, it's going to be, um, it's going to be, you know, really, really a big uh, challenge going forward. And why? Well, I mean, you know, many of us are used to travel a great deal because traveling and getting people's faces and sitting next to them, you know, whatever they are around, around the world as being sort of a key, uh, you know, a key way to, you know, to activate that connection, to deepen that connections to you know to maintain that connection but now doing this over zoom you know we some of us are really going to have to reinvent ourselves so this is this is going to be interesting and i'm hopefully that answer you know your second question better than the first one no it's great thank you all, all of your sure, of course. insight is uh, is really helpful thank you for sharing that i think you, and genuinely i think you touch on the, the key things there in terms of when i was speaking to ceos you know what is it that they're really looking for i think you touch on that so thank you for answering those questions i'm going to come to naomi um <clears throat> naomi just on the topic we talked in the in the presentation there philip talked about csr um, and we are i think it's fair to say that we are um seeing an, an, an increase in environmental awareness um, and an increasing emergence of purpose uh, driven organizations and many organizations are rethinking their csr strategies um, so particularly given your business, so your business, Suez, um, but actually what, what role does the corporate comms function actually play in developing the CSR strategy of the business um, and the associated activities that come from it? What role does your comms team play actually in developing that? Thank you, Andrew. I mean, first of all, I completely agree that, you know, as Willem said earlier, you know, we see particularly with the under 35s that they're wanting to have a purpose and wanting the company that they work for and buy from to have a purpose is increasingly important. And I strongly think that, although I agree with Willem, I think it will, might drop a couple of points in their next survey, it, it is definitely going to continue. Because as people come out of the crisis phase of a, of a crisis and go through the regression and recovery phase, they're seeking that purpose. And I think CSR is going to be a really big part of that purpose. So at my company, we actually have a sustainability and CSR team. And we have leads on things like social value and sustainable development. And my team work extremely closely with that team. And I think as to the question as to whether sustainability and CSR should sit in comms or not, to me, I think it's a bit of a mute point. I think the most important thing is you've got a team of experts who know what they're doing. But the communications function, if CSR and sustainability and social value don't sit in comms need to be extremely closely involved with the other team. So in our company, we talk every day, we meet every week and we have built that plan together. But the key thing for me is having experts that really know how to drive it through. Great, thank you for that. And then I guess just building on that question, what um, you know, what tools do you actually use to communicate your CSR approach to all stakeholders? And how do you how do you measure the effectiveness of your CSR comms? So I think the point that was made in the study about you know internal and external comms really being the same thing is absolutely critical when it comes to 
communicating on CSR. If you don't have your house in order, if your employees don't believe what you're trying to say around CSR, and if you don't have that brand and culture match, it's all gonna fall completely flat. So we have completely concentrated on the internal side before the external, making sure we have our commitments, making sure we have our actions, and then you then kind of going external with everything. And that's that's so important. And it, it's also really important because, you know, CSR has moved on from a company having to talk about how it's mitigating risk to saying to employees and customers how we can help you as our employee and customer to be better at CSR. And that, that's a fundamental shift. It's moved from mitigating risk to how we can help as a brand or company. And that's all about employee voice. So, you know, you have to do that through your employees, not through facts and figures. So therefore internal before external, so important. And when it comes to measurement, um, I would advise looking at all strands of the areas that you measure on. So uh, your work with communities, governance, ethics, um, you know, accountability are, are all hugely connected with CSR. So looking at the way you measure those, both on a measurement and, and you know, and so sort of output and outcome basis is absolutely critical. So, you know, when you're surveying your customers, when you're surveying your stakeholders, when you're surveying your employees, really building that in. And then the last point I would say is that you have to then also use some external measurement tools like a social value calculator or a carbon calculator to help you with an outside expert approved by government to say, this is what you're doing well, this is not what you're doing well, and this is where you're your communications around CSR need to focus on. Brilliant, thank you. That's very insightful actually. Thank you for sharing your, your thoughts actually what's going on in Suez as well. Thank you for that. I say, yeah, CSR is definitely a big topic that came through very strongly in, in, the, in the interviews that we did. Um, I'm now going to come to um, Abhinav. Um, actually picking up on the topic of digitalization, actually I can see some questions coming through and I think there's a question actually that relates in, in part to, to one of the questions that I was going to ask. So, um, so in our report, Abhinav, the ownership of digitalization in organizations is debated by the CEOs. Um, and it's not always seen as the communicator's responsibility to own digital. And the question I think we've had is, is it marketing, is it comms, is it someone else's uh, responsibility? And obviously digitalization is, is a huge yeah. topic. In, in your opinion, Abhinav, should, should, should the communications function be leading and own digitalization? Should it be someone else and, and, and why? Well, uh, Andrew, that's a great question. Um, before that, uh, a huge congratulations to you and to Willem on the launch of this important report, right? I think um, the very fact that 24 CEOs have come in to give their input is, is a great service to the profession. Also reflects on the relationships that the VMA group has with them, but also in a sense, it talks about the maturity of the relationship between communications, the CCO role and the CEO role, right? That they're willing to give so much of their time towards the evolution of the function. This question you put in on, on, on digitization is a very, very important one. I think, um, you know, if we take a step back, uh, for us as a business, we are one of the world's leaders, leading technology companies. So, you know, we live digitization. It's, the, it's literally the work which we do. But if you look at it from a communications angle, um, I feel that three kind of th trends which are coming together, which is really creating um, a very fast pace of change. Firstly, um, the digitization itself is accelerating. Uh, it has been accelerating over the last decade. The pandemic has um, made it even more so. Uh, I think you mentioned somewhere in the report that given the pandemic, uh, we've seen three years worth of digitalization done in three months during the lockdown. Certainly true. Um, there was a recent survey which was taken of 800 big business executives across the world. And 85% of companies said that they really feel they have accelerated their digital journeys, particularly in the last four or five months, right? So that's accelerating. Communication itself is accelerating. I think um, all the co my co-panelists here, Luca, Mark, and Naomi, and I'm sure anyone who's attending has been living through this period, particularly with the pandemic, uh, where the comms function has been asked to come in and deliver uh, a lot, right? Um, it, the comms has played an important role in, in, in external communications and keeping clients and communities engaged. At the same time, internal communication has seen a huge boost using digital channels to keep employees engaged. Uh, communications have been putting out the narrative of the company at this time, which is very, very important to talk about what our company is doing as, as responsible organizations to deal with this situation towards CSR, as Naomi was just talking about. 
it's also changed our businesses i mean luca has that ship behind him um and we were just joking at the start of the conversation that maybe they should launch a new product which is a a two week isolation from covid on board a cruise ship right um but more seriously i think every business is reinventing its products and services to be relevant to the current age so comms has a role in in this whole relaunch of businesses and business models and then lastly as you say in your report the old um, you know the 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 fireman's job has not gone away which is crisis communications uh, in this stage managing the reputation of your company particularly during times of change where you're rebalancing supply chains possibly restructuring your businesses that remains important on top of all of this um, we're living in this age of technology where um, you know uh, stories tend to go viral robert schiller the nobel prize winning economist had written this book called narrative economics i recommend reading it in case you haven't but essentially what it says is that stories particularly stories that go viral have today an increasing economic consequences right you can create a recession or you can get out of a recession based on what is the narrative which is being applied so you know when you put all of this together um the the rise of digitization the acceleration in communications and the power of stories and narrative economics i think uh, communications has a very very important role to play on on two fronts uh, one is of course disrupting itself as a function and engaging in digital channels i think we've done it certainly uh, more and more so and this year more than ever uh, but also in in kind of talking about the digital transformation journey that your business is going through right um as one very very quick example um a european team won the gartner communication award this year for their digital storytelling campaign so this was about um, getting 15 of our customers to talk about their digital journeys and the changes they've made you've quoted for example uh, runstart in your report quite extensively so one of the stories there was about runstart and how they've uh, managed to consolidate all their global data centers across the world into a single and the largest implementation of a public cloud and that's been essential in helping them create new services and a new capabilities and for the first time seeing all their global data together in one place which gives them a lot of uh, capability so this was storyfied there was a video thing made on it uh, the ceo of runstar was involved in it and they launched this story during their quarterly uh, the annual uh, results last year right so our communications teams work very closely together on it so just as one example i think um, there is a lot on this front where the where where the comms function has has tremendous opportunity and and an important role to play thank you abnam and actually just building on that then just thinking about yeah. it just like, what some uh, given the feedback that you've heard then from the 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 24 ceos that took part in this report what's your view i know we we sort of asked uh, luke on this earlier but actually your view on on the future relationship um between the the CEO and the CCO how do you see that future relationship developing yeah and i think um you know if you look back at it uh, i've been in the communication profession for for two decades now right if 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 i rewind and go back to the start of the millennium in 2000 in the year 2000 a lot of what willem was saying is true what our communication department was doing was very basic stuff there was basic media relations press release maybe some lunches with journalists uh, internally there were newsletters and things like that right if you look at it from today's concept that stuff looks very basic and the function has evolved over the period of time and gained a lot of scope and responsibility over this period of time right um i think a lot of us have lived through this evolution during this period the um relationship between the ceo and the cco has certainly strengthened right i think um you know if you look back 20 years ago the talk about being an executive committee or being on the board was just not even there it was not even a, it's a pipe dream today uh, i think executive committee presence is a given there is uh, on the boardroom as you said in your report um, irrespective of whether a communicate c chief communication officer is on the board or not but they expected to play a role on boardroom related issues right so 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 there's been this rapid evolution uh, and i think if you ask me uh, it is set to continue to grow it's not a it's not a easy time to be a chief executive officer you know we're living in an age of complexity of great you know changes of uh, changes in, in if you look at from a ceo's point of view right um leave even if you leave the pandemic out of it and and its disruptive force um the mega trends which we're seeing in the world are are immense right just just to talk about a few very very quickly is um we've been seeing over the few years political polarization and 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 what that means there is this big economic shift which has taken place in fact this year is the inflection year in which um uh, by purchasing power parity more than 50% of the world's gdp has now shifted to asia right there's economic shift taking place 
in the context today of uh, more and more rising economic nationalism geopolitically. There is the point on climate, which has become more and more important over the time. It has political consequences, social consequences, and consequences for businesses. Uh, the technology we've spoken a lot about uh, previously, but not just enterprise technology, there's also the rise of technology from a consumer point of view. The other thing this year is, will be known for is this is the year where more than half the world's population has gone active on social media. This in 2020, 3.8 billion people are active on social media. That has immense consequences on every front for businesses, for society, for media, news, you name it, right? Um, and then um, kind of there's changes in my markets um, caused by demographics, age, and of course, um, the current situation which we're living through with the pandemic. In this very complex scenario, it's very tough to be the CEO. Um, you know, to use a term, I, the, the, the CEO today is, is living in an age of activism in which they feel unprecedented pressure. They have pressure from employees to uh, change and to weigh in on social issues. They have pressure from their clients, they have pressure from investors, often benign investors as well, who want their businesses to change, from regulators, you name it, from every front. And as CEOs look to navigate this uncertain situation, I think more and more call upon the chief communications officer to be their um, consigliere, their guide, you know, all those roles which you spoke about in the report is to protect them, strengthen the business, strengthen their reputation, and personally help them navigate some very difficult choices from time to time. I think uh, in this, there's a massive opportunity uh, for chief communications officers to be even more relevant than ever, but there are also downsides. I don't know if you'll get a time to talk about it, but you can have entire seminars on the downsides. Just, just to list two is with these growing expectations on the communications function, and, and, and Willem, you spoke about that last point on why things don't happen is investment. Unless you strengthen the teams and capability and skills and the investment behind the function, the risks of burnout only grow right in this profession. And, and you see it more so during the pandemic. The other risk, which is an interesting one, uh, we were talking amongst a bit, bunch of communicators uh, in, in earlier session a couple of weeks ago, is uh, you know when you look back to your previous report, uh, I think I, I saw one fact which you listed is that 50% of the CEOs who you had polled four years back in 2016 are no longer CEOs of their companies. Right um, now, as the CCO role gets closer and closer to the CEO, I think one of the things which CCOs are, are concerned about is if you're seen too close to the CEO and CEO tenures are short, does that also start to affect you? Are you seen as too close to the previous CEO when a new administration takes place and, and other things like that? But anyway, it's, I think it could not be a more exciting time. You called it the golden age. It is, it is indeed the age of opportunity for the field of communications. Brilliant. Thank you, Abna, for sharing that. Um, some Actually, some very insightful thoughts there. Thank you for that. Um, so that gives a few minutes to come to you. Thank you for your kind words, actually, as well, on our report. Uh, much appreciated. Um, just coming to Mark, then. Um, Mark, just some questions for you. Um, just picking up, I guess, on that internal comms um, question that came up in the report. So, and again, within the context of, of COVID-19. So, you know, as a result of COVID-19, there, there is a greater shift to remote working, understandably we all know that, and that has created um, a lot of challenges for organisations, it's created a lot of challenges for individuals as well. But how do you, how do you think organisations, or how's Google, how, how do you maintain high levels of employee engagement um, when you're dealing and managing a very remote workforce? What's your thoughts on that? Sure, and thanks, Andrew and, and Willem, uh, for having me. Um, yeah, on, on that topic of um, employee engagement in, in times of COVID-19, I think it's definitely become a more important topic. If you look at internal comms, uh, employee engagement, it's probably true for a lot of people on this call that we've been spending more time than ever on these topics um, than before the time of uh, COVID-19. And if you look at um, what was important for Google, we're really focused on helping our employees stay connected on all the important issues. And uh, for instance, we set up an in information hub to help people find all kinds of updates uh, about COVID-19 and our response. Um, our data shows that Googlers have used that 6 million times, um, which is quite a lot. Um, if you look at uh, live stream events, they're really helping us to feel more connected to. And even though everything is online now, the data shows that our company-wide meetings have higher viewership and attendance uh, than ever before. Um, and I think most importantly, what we've made sure that working together with HR, with leadership, 
that we really put people first. Uh, so some examples of that are uh, giving people the opportunity to take parental leave if that would help them if they have kids, um, uh, homeschooling, um, offering mental health support, which is I think really important in these times, um, giving uh, collective company-wide global days off, uh, giving everyone some money to help them improve their workplace at home, buy a good chair, etc. These are all small things, but all together, working together with HR, with leadership, I think it sends a very strong signal and hopefully increases trust that employees have in, in, in management. And we actually did a bit of a survey recently um, and we've seen trust go up, even though this has been a very challenging year for everyone, including Googlers. Uh, we see an uptick when it comes to whether Googlers think that um, the company has the right priority. Uh, priorities. We see an increase when it comes to the question of are you proud to be part of Google? Uh, we see an increase on the question of whether our products are actually being helpful to people in their day daily uh, moments and whether we're helping people cope through COVID uh, with our products. So I think to that point of uh, internal as external, I think that also does something for the uh, perception that I have, people have outside of Google of the company. I think that if people see that you trust your employees in the right ways, that they will be more inclined to trust the company itself uh, more as well. Um, and I think this is an exciting time. Like it's a very challenging year, but we'll also have to completely reinvent the way we work, right? Um, so uh, right now, um, we don't have a lot of Googlers in our offices. We're quite conservative to protect, uh, protect everyone's health. But once we go back to work, what will that actually look like? And how can comms play a role in really reinventing uh, the way we work and what that new workplace looks like? I think those are all super interesting questions uh, where, Andrew, to your question, uh, comms can play a, a very uh, vital role in designing all of the answers to that. Thanks, Mark. I think you're, you're spot on with that. Um, and actually, just more broadly, and given the nature of your business, how do you, um, in terms of more generally, how has how has sort of this new digital era boosted the way that, that you see businesses generally generally work? And have you got any sort of thoughts or insight on that? Well, I, I think that like one question you could ask is, what would have happened to the economy if COVID played out ten years ago, when mobile phones we're nowhere near where they are now when video calling was only just getting started, when businesses didn't sell as much online, I think the economic and societal damage would have been much, much larger. And that's not to claim any credit for being able to like keep the world economy running. This point is not about Google, but about technology in the wider sense. I think it um, has accelerated a lot of trends by years and years, the last like nine months. If you look at a product like meet the uh, video technology that we use at Google and that a lot of businesses use. We now have over 100 million people using it. And um, when the, the top search oh, sorry, <laughs> my phone is talking at me. Um, and, and we can actually see that um, there's about 3 million new users uh, coming online every day. Um, I, I think the economy has become much more digital in just nine months. And we would never have seen that uh, without COVID happening. Um, I think it was also interesting to read your report and uh, see what CEO said about digital. Um, a lot of language about things becoming more complex, things becoming more challenging, social media being a challenge, having millions of options about uh, where you can place your bets. I, I miss the word opportunity a little bit, and I think that is also where we can come in as a comms function and help CEOs with a, a bit of a paradigm shift. Because, yeah, there's millions of options where to, you can place your bet, but there's also millions of opportunities. I think that, like, comms leaders especially can uh, show how you can build a, a lot of uh, relationships at scale using your own channels. If you look at our global Twitter account, it's over 21 million followers. Our global YouTube account, that's uh, 71 million. Um, and we're obviously not alone on this. A lot of companies are using digital to build meaningful relationships at skills at scale with stakeholders, customers, et cetera. But 
I would say in terms of the culture that like we as comms leaders need to lead the way towards CEOs and basically make them a bit more enthusiastic about the opportunities rather than look at the challenges. But Mark, do you, if I may, do you think that the last couple of months have sort of helped or pushed CEOs in looking at digitalization from complex, difficult to yes, indeed an opportunity? Yeah, I, I, I definitely hope so and, and, and think so. I think that um, if you would have asked a lot of CEOs, would you be comfortable with having most of your people work from home and do you think productivity will be the same? I think that a lot of people would have been quite nervous about that. A lot of executives, if you had uh, asked that question. And I think the reality is that uh, we've seen that technology can actually help people stay connected. Um, and that in a lot of cases, productivity hasn't dropped that much either. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm hoping that we, we will see a bit of a mind shift in uh, 2020 uh, due to COVID and that, that may be one very small silver lining. Thanks, Mark, for sharing that. I'm very mindful that we are quickly, quickly running out of time and we're, we're not going to have time to go through all of the questions uh, that uh, that we've had. Um, just a couple of things. Someone's asked, we are recording this, so we are recording this and you can you can watch it back, you can share it with people. Um, you know, you, you can, if there's people in your team that you think may want to see it, then please do feel free to share it. Someone's asked a question as well, you know, do we name the CEOs that um, we interviewed? They are named and quoted in the report. So if you look at the report, you'll see organisations from the UK, European based, and, and, and who they were and who the CEOs were. So if you download the reports, as I say, which you can do from um, our website, you'll, you'll, you'll see all of that. Um, Andrew, if I may uh, just offer a quick tip there, having read the report cover to cover, I think unlike many other reports where you look at the statistics and numbers, what I really like about this report is the qualitative aspect. Some of the richest insights are in the, in the specific quotes that CEOs have gone and record with. So I think each and every one of them is really worth reading. Thanks, Abner. I think you're right. You know, the, the, the quotes that we, we had in the last report, that's, that's what we've really tried to pick out. I think the quotes are quite insightful in, in themselves. So um, yes, I think you're, you're right on that. Maybe just one final question, actually, which I'm going to put to Willem, um, because he hasn't had a question to him, but maybe I will on this. Willem, we've had someone ask, I think this is quite an interesting question, that the CEOs are saying they want strategy, they're saying they want strategic support, but then sometimes they're just asking for a newsletter, you know, so what they say they want and what they actually then ask for, do, do you get a sense, Willem, that, that there is there is a difference there, uh, maybe in the, in the work that you do, working with, with organisations or, or from the interviews that you did, or are CEOs saying they want strategy and asking for strategy, or sometimes they ask for tactical support? Yeah, well, it probably depends on the CEO and the company and the context. Uh, in all fairness, CEOs that participated in this survey are CEOs that have an opinion and an interest in communications. Um, and, and I do know quite a few companies, because we always notice it with briefings, uh, where CEOs actually want just somebody who executes their orders. Uh, and then you have to find them people matching that profile. Um, it is what it is in some cases. But I think, as I said before, you know, there's always an opportunity for good people to start adding more value than asked for, more value than expected, provided you know the company and you add things to, the, to, 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 to a CEO. And maybe not all CEOs in the world are open to that, but I think, well, they're also only human. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, just do the basics first and show them that, that you know the company better and you can add more value and then you'll be invited, um, I think, by and large. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Sorry, sorry, again, the advice, you know, to both comms leaders, because we did that after the last survey, and we had discussions with comms leaders, and I asked them the question, are you willing to invest extra time uh, in order to add more value? And some, they took on the challenge, and some were a bit reluctant, because they had other things to do in their life, which is fine, but that was the choice they made. Uh, but the advice we also have to those aspiring to become a comms leader, and there will be quite a few on this call, uh, you know, Advice stays, get to know your company, do what you need to do, and then start adding value, and it will be appreciated. Okay. Thanks, Willem. So I say, um, it was a lot to get through in an hour. Um, I think we've packed a lot in, um, but inevitably we've, we've uh, run out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to answer all of the questions that have been put to us, but I think we'll try and, if we can, reflect on those. Maybe we'll try and post some, some thoughts or blogs on those questions, particularly off the back of this, uh, which we can put on our, our website. So just some just some thanks, really. Um, in fact, yes, if you bring up that slide there, Naomi, you can see uh, the next slide, where to download 
uh, the report uh, from our website. As I say, you'll find the, the old report on there as well. So just some thanks really from, from myself and Willem and VMA Group. The first thing, actually, thanks to the thanks to the CEOs that took part, and obviously thanks to the, the comms directors that, that supported us in introducing us to their, their CEOs. Um, we couldn't have done it without them, so uh, hugely indebted. Thanks clearly to all of the attendees uh, that have come along this morning to, to listen and actually share this. The more that we talk about these things, the more that we share this information, the better it supports the comms community and those people in it, and the better we know it supports business, etc. in the long run. So thank you all for coming and, and sharing your questions and thoughts, etc. But obviously, lastly, huge, huge and special thanks to all of our panellists. And as I said at the start, you know, very experienced comms and Marcoms professionals in their own right. So some very different um, organisations as well across across Europe and, and, and the UK. So thank you all, um, our panellists, for, for all of your insight and, and sharing your, your thoughts with us this morning. Um, so yes, finally, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. So you can watch it back, you can download the reports. Um, we'll inevitably be running other webinars and things in the future. So please do come and get involved again. And uh, we look forward to all seeing you all at some point again in the future. But I wish you all a, a very good day and, uh, and good luck with everything, whatever, whatever that may be. But good luck and thanks for joining in. Many thanks.